welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for attending our session. And um, we are from St. Norbert College and looking forward to sharing with all of you um, where we are at with our domains project. We're one year in. And um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, my name is Chrissy, and I'm the director of academic technology at St. Norbert. Uh, like I said, we're, we're looking forward to you know, this is one of our report outs on how we've come as far as we have with our domains project. I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Ben. Uh, technology innovationist is the title I make up sometimes. <laughs> and I make I make it up for different like I have different titles for different presentations. That's pretty fun. Um, and I uh, run the thing called the Tech Bar on campus, um, which you're going to learn a little bit more about, and that's how we support our domains project. And then my name is Cassie. I am a student. I'm a rising sophomore, and I'm a research fellow for full spectrum learning and also Tech Bar consultant. So we wanted to get a little feel from our audience uh, where some of you are at with the means projects before we dove too far into this. Um, so just with a show of hands, I know we would assume that you know we're all here at domains conference, that everybody has a domain program at their school, but maybe not. How many of how many of you do have a domains program? <laughs> okay. Some kind of. Right. Um, then the other question I have is we have is just what is for those of you that do have a domains program one of the things that you're going to learn about from us is how we support that um, and we're, we're curious to hear from you what your support structure is like do you have a department that supports it do you have students that support it um, anybody is willing to share kind of we're really open to thieving that. things from other people so uh, <laughs> as you'll find out in the presentation so if there's anything good we're just going to steal it <laughs> yeah. anybody yeah. yeah i'm from wake forest university and we're still in the pilot uh, stage and um, we will support it kind of based on what people are doing with it so i'm in um, the libraries digital humanities uh, team and um, so we'll support it when people are using it for digital research projects. And then our academic academic technology team will support more classroom uh, facing and student facing projects. So it's kind of Supporting it's, it's a very it Wake Forest areas. thing. A very like <laughs> uh, very like what are you doing? And, and there are a lot of different people to support different groups on campus. Interesting. So but we're trying to work all together to to roll it out in a unified way. But there will be different groups of people supporting different. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so at, um, at Grinnell, we, we have about a, 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 a main project with about 100 accounts or so. And so uh, it's supported by our, um, my team, Digital Liberal Arts Collaborative. So myself and really two other team members are the most uh, uh, engaged in the direct day to day support. And we call on IT, we're not part of IT, we're part of the Teaching and Learning Center, so we, have, we will uh, have a liaison in IT to help us with things that, uh, that they need to uh, help with in terms of Active Directory integration and things like that. So we don't, at this time, we don't have any student level support. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we're similar to Mo, we have only faculty that are in the domains program and there's probably about 100 or plus that have websites and so those websites exist in varying degrees some of them are just a standard template that gets installed and i'll deal with this later um, and then there's some really neat research projects that people have put up but i'm essentially the lead support and then i have my director of our division and another graphic designer who works with faculty put their sites up and kind of gives them a nice visual flair to them so at, at this point we Thank you. So my name is Randall um, from Georgetown University. Um, I think a lot of our support either comes in the through a central email that we have, uh, and I will answer emails there. We also have student workers who are engaged in supporting uh, requests and answering questions and then looking into inquiries there. Um, if we ever do need to escalate those to one of our developers um, or one of our other staff members, we are able to do that too. But I think probably one of the more important ways that we, we support as well is by trying to integrate that support um, 
at the start of any given project, so in a class session, being there with them um, in, in a consultation with a faculty member, really talking through and thinking through where they want to go with it. Um, and that really helps to avoid a lot of the more, um, that really helps to get ahead, I guess, of a lot of questions as well. Thank you. Yeah, we, um, you know, we wanted within this presentation, you know, recognizing that there's so many different models out there, uh, and each institution is going to have its own uh, culture in terms of how to best support that. And so ours is just one example, but um, you know, as much as we're sharing back with all of you, what our structure looks like, we're, we're looking for other ideas and looking for feedback as well. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, so we've shared with you what we hope to get out of this session after reading our uh, intro. Is there anything in particular that you were hoping to get out of this session um, before we move forward? And we'll be sure to touch on that. But is there is there anything specific that you were looking for? Yes. I did not do training and training one's own program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We were wondering the same thing before we start before we started as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, an elevator pitch if you have it. Like yes. uh, okay. how do you describe domains? I find it hard to describe. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we'll let Cassie do that part. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Actually we might and it's not in this slide, but we might have just that elevator pitch of some of what we've been using. So. Anything else? Yeah. How do you like build excitement around it? Okay, that's a great one. I think we can answer some of those things. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. How you kind of provide offline support and tutorials and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of the whole big picture, not just interest, but like how do you sell, for lack of a better term, to your administration? Why is this sort of initiative, especially since it's kind of not typical, very typical? How you know? How do you sell? How do you help them understand why this fits with your mission and is something that we should commit institutional resources to doing? Which kind of happens before you do the excitement building, I guess. Yeah, I think we have that in there too. Yeah. If so, thank you for that. Um, and as, as we share some of the things that uh, we've been doing this past year, if your questions don't necessarily get answered, um, please ask them again when we've got the Q&A at the end. Um, so what we'd like to share with you is really kind of a, a three-pronged approach that we've taken to our domains project. Um, and one of that is starting with something that we call full spectrum learning. So I'll be sharing a little bit more about that with you um, and where domains has fit in to that. Um, the other support structure that we have is our tech bar. And Ben is going to share more about that with you. Keeping uh, in the center of all of this, you can go ahead and click once more, uh, our students. You know, really keeping our students at the center. So you'll see how that has kind of evolved over time. Um, so, one of the things that uh, a kind of philosophy uh, that we've adopted at St. Harvard is something that we call full spectrum pedagogy. And this started um, several years ago, I want to say four or five years ago already. Um, and it started with a need for the college to define what we mean by hybrid course. And uh, there wasn't a designation within our registrar when faculty were teaching a course to actually identify what a hybrid course was. And it was through that process that we came up with a definition for what we meant by hybrid course, which is uh, an actual um, less face-to-face -face time, which is augmented by some online time. But this notion of full spectrum pedagogy where we felt it is important for our students throughout the four years of their time at St. Harvard College to experience uh, a tried and true face-to-face lecture-based course and then everything um, up to a fully 
digital online course. And uh, one of the mantras at St. Margaret College is ever ancient, ever new, which is actually our theme for this upcoming year. Um, so we believe that you know students should experience everything from uh, a traditional uh, ways of teaching to more new ways of teaching. And that actually, um, this idea of full spectrum pedagogy found its way into our strategic plan. So it is now an identified activity within the strategic plan um, and has received funding to support that. So that's been really helpful. Um, but we expanded on that. You know, when we think of pedagogy, we're also often thinking of just the teacher um, and the way they teach. And we wanted the students to be at the center of this. So that was changed. Um, in the last couple of years to full spectrum learning. And uh, where we included, so the, the pedagogy part is um, kind of on the y axis, and on the x axis, we pulled in um, student engagement and recognizing that good teaching can happen um, within this spectrum of teaching approaches. But we also knew that, this is my other animation. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> we knew that, we, we believe that the majority of um, courses were being, that were being offered, and we had that data, you know, where most of the courses are face to face, are, most of the courses are falling within here. So if we want students to truly have that breadth of experiences, um, over the course of the four years, we didn't have enough courses that were really probably falling within this area of the spectrum. So we knew that this was going to have to be some of our focus and our support. And to best support courses and faculty that maybe wanted to try some new things and think a little differently and offer things in this area, that Domains was going to be one of those tools that would would best support this. So that's part of what really launched some of this for us. Um, we also have this premise that um, in addition to uh, students receiving a, a strong foundation in a liberal arts education, that also giving them a strong understanding of digital literacy and citizenship combined with that is what is going to um, really help them in pursue their interests after their four years at St. Norbert. Um, so that's part of what is guiding us in the work that we do. Yeah. What is the editor to Norbert uh, Norbert Teen. Norbert -teen. Norbert. So um, we are the only Norbert Teen College uh, in Earth. the U.S. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., <laughs> yes. There's a, a, a scholastic tradition um, it is, it's an order, it's a Promonstrian order of uh, brothers, and it is based on uh, one of the Norbertine ideals is of communio, living in community. So um, a lot of what we do is, that's part of who we are. The way. They're also excellent brewers. Yeah. They, <laughs> they are amazing brewers. You would, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> So one of the things, just kind of interesting uh, tidbits of our journey in all of this is um, we had known about some things that other institutions were doing. And so we literally wanted to just go and see what they were doing and learn from others. So we, we took a field trip and um, piled into a SUV and went across country and made visits at University of Mary Washington, at Bryn Mawr, and at Muhlenberg to learn from some of the things that they were doing. And it's, uh, we can talk to you more about that on the side, but it was, um, how was it four of us? It was There's four. Four. Four of us. Yeah, four of us piling into an SUV and getting Airbnbs and uh, learning a lot on that trip. I recommend it, you should definitely do it. Yeah, it was, it was one of the best professional development experiences we've had. When did you do the field trip? Uh, it was uh, about a year and a half ago. It was in November the, that we went. Yeah, it was December 2017. December. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So some of the takeaways from that, well, a lot of great takeaways, um, but from Bryn Mawr, we learned more about uh, the Bryn Mawr framework, digital competencies framework, and uh, what they, what that, what really stood out to us um, about their framework and being there and hearing from their faculty was that it served as um, a common language for their teaching and learning. That's what we were we were really impressed by is their faculty were using this framework to kind of teach, you know, talk about their teaching. Um, at UMW, one of the things that uh, biggest takeaway for us, and we made this change right away, and we'll share more about it, is that that student support structure that they had, um, their digital knowledge center, that needed to be located near us. Um, so just the physical proximity between uh, ourselves and the students was really important. Um, and at Muhlenberg, um, we were really impressed with their student workers that we visited with and their ability to just very naturally articulate the digital citizenship skills that they were learning through the work that they were doing. So they, they had a student support structure in place um, and it was like similar, you know, they had this common language that, you know, the students were fluent in. Um, with the Bryn Mawr Digital Competencies, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with those, um, but these are five competencies that they've developed that they feel all of their students uh, should attain at some point um, in their liberal arts experiences, and we've integrated that into some of the things that we're doing as well. I found that to be really helpful. Um, so we, this last summer, launched our night domains. Um, so it's night.domains, we have, um, go ahead, we've, over the course of the year, have grown, started at about, I think we had like 16, and now we, uh, I know now we're upwards of 300 domains uh, over the course of one year. Most of those being students, um, we do have some faculty that have created their own domains, um, we have had staff that have created some as well, and then we've got some clubs and things like that that are taking advantage of this. Um, one of the things that is highlighted on our site, and this is a shout out to Autumn Keynes, uh, when she was with us, she designed this for us, it's really awesome, highlighting some of the examples that we have. So if you'd like to see uh, some of the things that are being done with domains at St. Robert, um, it's just off of our night.domains site, and then you can go to the examples, but just examples from how it has been integrated into courses, as well as individual students who have done some things. And I would say, because I don't think I was going to mention this later, this is really helpful when students come in for appointments, or faculty or staff come in for appointments to, to learn about domains for the first time, and they go, what can I do? We can take them to these examples and give them, like, it's hard when you first, like, um, you change your domain constantly, like I still change mine all the time. So it's good to have those examples. So this is super helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess that, that's me. I'll take over. That's me. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we created this thing called the Tech Bar. Yeah. Yep. And um, it, it grew out of. Um, it grew out of some other experiences we had when I first started. And that came, let me just get to the, where we're at here. Here we go. Um, it, the tech bar piece of it came from, uh, our, our CIO is pretty amazing and he really is into experimenting and pivoting and like failing and like it's totally okay to do that. Um, I don't know that that was always the case, uh, but in the past, but it, with, with him it's been amazing. Um, so we were able to try new things and see how it worked out. This is sort of one part of the group of the tech bar and our students. But we started actually um, from our makerspace on campus. 
And so being liberal arts, one of the things we don't really have as much, we don't have very many engineering students or anything like that. And so the makerspace, we tried lots of different stuff, it just wasn't working. Part of it was it was in the library and we are not located in the library. And so there was not a lot of supervision of our student workers and very, like the same six students on, on campus came to use the makerspace and just used the 3D printer constantly. And then all I did was spend my time fixing the 3D printer and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and I think we need to transition to something else. And that's when Chrissy and I started talking a little bit about like, well, what can we do? And we wanted to help students gain digital literacies and competencies. We wanted to create something like a writing center on campus so that the students can go to the writing center and they get help on their writing and become better writers. We wanted to do that for anything digital. And that's where the tech bar came in to, to be. Basically, originally the tech bar we had like a menu of services you can keep you can even you got to choose you know what the what, what you wanted to get help on uh, it was pretty neat um, and then we started it in a different building again as i <laughs> hadn't learned our, our lesson yet but we started in a different building we had cool lights to try to attract people up in the corner that <laughs> attracted a lot of people over to go hey this is neat and then they would walk off <laughs> um, and then we eventually transitioned into ITS itself after we went out and saw like that was going to be key to success. And we hired um, a, between seven and ten students, it kind of depends, it fluctuates a little bit, um, to work at the tech bar. Uh, and so you kind of see the iteration of moving into, uh, we've, we've gone into classrooms as well, so we have students that go into classrooms to talk about domains or help with setting up domains. Um, we have. We often have multiple students. We'll be full in ITS, like there's literally no room. Some of that is a lot of, a lot of student workers like to hang out in our area, um, because there's coffee and whatever, we try to make it kind of fun. But um, we often have several people working all at the same time, getting set up on domains, it's, it's pretty awesome. And then we've done cool things like giving them headshots for our, for our website, things like that. Um, but the cool part is, it, one, of the, one of the big takeaways that we had from um, from our East Coast trip was we wanted to have a student-centered area, which is what this is, but it, the, the tech bar, so one of the differences between a DKC and us um, is that we also serve staff and faculty on digital literacies. Anybody can come and create a domain, anybody can come and learn how to be more productive using the productivity tools we have on campus or learn how to make a video or anything. It doesn't matter who they are, anybody can come in. We've had alumni come in and get help. And that was important to me, that was open to everybody, because that was going to expose this area to more people, and it was gonna get more student groups involved as well, because people have student workers on campus, and like, <coughs> we need to know how to use Excel, or we need to, you know, whatever, they can send them in, and we can help them out with that, that stuff, which is awesome. Um, but the coolest thing that happened, like last semester, we really wanted to get faculty involved. This was a, an initiative to make sure we were not supporting just students, but also supporting faculty and trying something new that they've never done before and feeling like, this is okay for me to try. And that is exactly what happened with Parisa. She walked in at the beginning of the semester. Um, she's a, a geography teacher, right? Geography? Yep. And she's super cool. Uh, she came from K-12. Uh, she's, I think, it's kind of working toward becoming full-time faculty. She's an admin right now. And she just said, I want to try something completely different. I pulled, I talked to my students and asked them what they, how they want to be assessed, and they talked about like a domain would be a, a, an awesome way to do that. I don't really know exactly what that means or how I'm going to do that, so we literally created this, this whole form of assessment in her class together. I came from K-12, so I was super excited about this. This was gonna be, this was gonna be not a hot dog for me. So if you were in that session, this was gonna be like, something that wasn't a hot dog. I was pretty excited about that. Um, and so she started looking into stuff, and we went. We, we had to create something that was going to support however the students wanted to show their like how they they wanted to show how they're going to be assessed. They wanted to show their knowledge in any way they wanted. So they could use Twitter. They could use a blog. They could use um, uh, mapping tools. They could create videos. Um, it it could be any of that. So we had to help her set up a way to assess that, um, which we did. Which is coming up. But what she said about this at the end of the semester was without the kind of support, she would never have felt comfortable even trying this thing. And that is exactly the sort of stuff we want to go to faculty with and say, see, we're, we're supporting you. Just give it a try, it'll be okay. Um, we set up a rubric where she could grade any of those different types of uh, forms of assessment. And it was going to be exactly the same for students. They knew how they were going to be assessed no matter what they turned in. There were some other criteria because they're obviously like a Twitter feed is a little bit different than a video. So she had some extra things there. 
but this was generally how that worked out. And she loved this. It was very simple for her and for her students. So these are just some just testimonials from the students a little bit. Um, I learned a lot by creating a domain. My professor allowed students to have a say in how they learned and were tested. That is something in higher ed you don't hear ever, I don't think. So this was pretty amazing. Uh, and they enjoyed that a lot. So we have examples like story maps. They could put that on their site because that's part of what they were learning about. And they were showing their learning in a different way that wasn't a test. Um, they were excited that they got to demonstrate their learning in various formats, uh, domains, and showcasing our learning. They were just like, I can showcase my learning. I can take this with me. And we had students come in multiple times. So they would come in and create their domain. We would talk about domain names and digital literacies. Um, we could probably do a better job at that overall, but we would start there and we would just continue to build on appointments. And then they come in for video work and they would come in for uh, mapping or whatever, but we were there to support them all the time. Uh, a lot of times with videos, this is sort of where you start, right? Like there's like four things in the video, and like this is a pretty good video, right? And you go, well, you could do something like this instead. And by the end, you get a very good, a very good video. They walk away with these amazing skills to create videos. Um, we have several people on staff that have their own YouTube channels, and like uh, we have one who actually is a music producer. He lives, he's from California, and uh, he's producing some ads for a pretty big name, um, which is pretty amazing to have on staff. Uh, which is another thing that I would say is super important, and I think um, UMW would say the same thing. You have to have really good students, so you have to hire the best possible students you can for this. It can't just be anybody. Um, and then, the last couple things here, allowing students to really think and be creative. Again, don't hear that too often, but that's awesome. That's what we want, I think. Uh, and applying the knowledge that you learned. So these are, again, all these are quotes from that course that she, that she did. That's a lot. That's a big percentage of her court class right there, and I didn't take all the quotes because there were too many. Um, so this is how we grew. In the fall of 2017, we, uh, that's when we were over in the other location. We had four appointments for the entire semester. It was, the students were pretty bored. Um, and then we grew to 25, then 78, and then to 149 this last semester. And our average uh, approval rating, because we do surveys after every single appointment, is 4.8. So we feel like we're doing a pretty good job, and we always do better, definitely, but that's, those are some pretty good indicators that we're growing very well. Um, we, have more, we have more classes that we're gonna be partnering with in the, in the fall as well, so we expect this to continue to grow. We have 600 domains purchased, and if things keep going the way they are, we might have to purchase more, and we find like that's a, that's a good problem to have at some point. Um, the other point that I just want to throw out there, remember I talked about staff and faculty as well. So we, all, the tech bar also does all the staff and faculty trainings, and we do two, two per year, like one in the winter and one in the summer. Um, and we did a little survey. This is, a, this is a tough one for people to fill out, I think, but how much time have you saved by coming to a tech bar training or coming into the tech bar and you have an appointment? Um, and basically you can see sort of the minimum, like I said, one to five all the way up to uh, the maximum, which was 10 to 15 hours. And so on the low side, we've saved 171 hours of time on campus. On the high side, 405, and in the middle, like 288. Also, we feel like that's a pretty good metric to go back to leadership with and say, this, this initiative is working. Let's keep bumping money into it and see where it goes. Um, and our, our staff, once they learn they can come in and get help, have been using it more and more and more and more. It's been amazing. And that leads us. So when I first came to campus last fall, I was hired to be a research fellow for Full Spectrum Learning. So when I came to campus, Full Spectrum Learning had a green and yellow grid. It wasn't very much promoted besides faculty, and I was hired to help make the website and explain this to other people. So through this year, I've been able to pull this together and explain to people what full spectrum learning is, here's what it's about. I completely redesigned the grid and added color so you can kind of see the lighter, the less engagement, less technology to the deep purple of max engagement, max technology. And then the main project I've been working on is the interactive grid, which is two to three minute videos from professors about classes they're teaching and where they've placed them, themselves on the grid. And the main reason this can really help students and people who don't really understand what this is would be to watch a video like up here in the top corner 
and then to watch a video down here and see what's different. And it's kind of just real world examples of explaining um, how the classes range and the mission that we have. And then if people don't really understand full spectrum learning, all of these have rollovers to maybe explain like what does open learning mean. And then one example of the video. To be really loud at the beginning. Probably. <laughs> advanced seminar in creative writing and contemporary literature. I placed myself in the intersection between open learning and technology-enhanced course design. The format of the class was a small group in-person workshop, and it was really a meeting of equals because uh, Dr. McDermott allowed us to create our own syllabus, and it was something that evolved along the way and it had not only her input but input by all of the other students so each student got to really build a syllabus that was specific to them and their future interests technology enhanced course design means the course is taught with face-to-face -face interaction and the course uses technology aspects along with more traditional methods but mostly Google Drive for students to share their work with each other, comment on it, uh, offer suggestions for revision. Uh, the technology definitely enhanced our learning because we were able to dive deeper into revision of a piece. Um, we could get past the first comments that are always like, oh, I liked it, or things like that, and really dive into you know, the structure of a piece. And it really just helped us make our work better. Open learning means faculty and students are active collaborative partners in learning. So in that class, I tried something new. I decided to do a choose your own adventure kind of syllabus. And knowing that too many choices can be overwhelming, I decided that I wouldn't just say, okay, so tell me what you want to do. And instead, I would decide what the goals for the course were and then I would have three or four options for to meet each of these goals. And then I, on the first day of class, we got together and I asked them, here, let's open this Google document, let's look at it. I want you to, together, and there were about five of them in the class, choose which option you want to go with. So they basically created the course down to the readings while we were sitting there on that first class meeting. The engagement of the classroom has a huge effect on my learning. The more that the professor is engaged, not only with uh, the everyday writing show of the class, but also the technology use, hugely boosts my engagement in the class. So seeing Dr. McDermott really get into the idea of building your own syllabus, and also seeing her so, so heavily use the common function on Google Drive on our own creative writing pieces, really helped me and all of the other students really want to be as engaged as she was the entire semester. So through Full Spectrum Learning is how I learned about Night Domains. And as Chrissy mentioned earlier, the main thing that I really think helps students is the examples page. Um, being able to see what's your possibilities. Um, I've had, I've seen a lot of students at the tech bar kind of come in saying, I have to do this for class, I don't want to do it. And then we explained to them what is a domain, how can you create it, showed them examples, and they like lit up and they were like, oh, I really like want to do this. And they spent like that night, they spent like five hours trying to create their own domain. And then they would come back to us with like little simple questions and it was just a really cool experience to see um, students become excited about domains. And then my personal domain. So since I'm only a first year student, I wanted to make my personal domain a blog about my experiences. And for me, it was an amazing way to connect with my family back home because easier than like calling all of them, I just blogged about what I did for the week and then I put it on Facebook and they all read it and then like they would like reach back out to me if they had questions. And it was just a really great way for me to share my experiences and I can be able to even like looking back at first semester and 
kind of forgetting some of the things I did, but having this blog to be able to go back. And then I also blog about my work with Full Spectrum Learning, but I made it a subdomain because I wanted it to be a little bit more professional, like a different color palette. My personal site is very picture-based. I love taking pictures. So this one doesn't really involve any pictures. It's more actually the work I've done, um, different experiments I've tried, and different things like that and I love the fact that I can make this space truly my own and also have separation between the two. And then the goal is to be the class of 2022 and then I'm a computer science and math double major and just in my first year mainly through full spectrum learning I've had a multitude of opportunities um, being a full spectrum learning research fellow and a tech bar consultant and um, my second month of being a student, I presented to the Board of Trustees that runs the college, which is a very scary experience, but <laughs> a very good experience. Um, and then I've been able to be involved in other clubs, and I've gained a lot of digital literacies, especially for me, video production. Um, I came from a background of domains. I did domains in high school, so I learned a lot through video productions. I hadn't really done as much with it, especially through WeVideo. And the three main projects I've worked on was the Full Spectrum Learning website, um, all the interactive teaser videos that you just watched, and um, redesigning the whole color grid for Full Spectrum Learning. So just to kind of wrap things up, what we've taken is um, this multi-pronged approach, uh, just with efforts in a lot of different areas, um, while at the same time, and this was important, I think, for uh, when we were working with our CIO um, and communicating things to the Board of Trustees, just also utilizing some of the research that others have done, um, case studies, and um, also pulling in both curricular and the co-curricular um, to fully support some of these things moving forward is what has contributed to our growth in this area. Um, so with that, we'll open it up to questions from you. Yes? I don't know if the microphone is probably pretty loud. I want to know, what was your thinking behind having someone, Cassia, just applaud your work, um, so how quickly you did it in the board of trustees? Was it intentional to actually have someone like Cassie or Cassie build out, like, as almost an assignment, the framing of the course, that creative writing course where you did that. Like, it's a brilliant idea. So I'm asking you, was that intentional to have the students actually build what might be considered the publicity for the amazing teaching and learning that's happening at SNC? Because if it wasn't an intentional model, it just seemed absolutely amazing to think about what they're framing for your community. Yeah. Video. Um, so I'll share a little story with you about that, and I'll put in a plug for DigPed Lab um, that is coming up. So we took a team to DigPed Lab last summer, um, and with the intention, and it was another <coughs> colleague and myself that attended the storytelling track while we were there, and we had this idea going into it that you know, we wanted to, I think we were thinking that we'd have a video, you know, about what full spectrum learning is. And it was through that experience and um, in consultation with other participants that were there, that was really awesome that we could kind of share ideas and brainstorm. And they were like, you need more voices in this. And that's, you know, we left that with this idea of, videos in in each of the areas of the grid and that having to be not our voices but you know faculty and student voices um, what uh, has happened though this this other year that has been really fun is Cassie and another one of her classmates Ruthie um, and her exam she's got her examples on mm -hmm. the website as well so she's another research fellow, and that's just a program that the college has. So we had applied for students to fill these roles. Um, hearing their conversations this past year, 
is probably what has been the most delightful of all of this is because they have brought this language kind of going back to that common language they've shared with us that they'll be sitting in their rooms talking about um, you know I, I'm sure every student could slip into the talking about classes in terms of what you like and what you don't like but they shared that they were having conversations with their classmates about how they're learning and um, what works for one person might work differently for another person. Those are incredible conversations for freshman students to be having. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all, but that's that was my takeaway. On it. I don't know. <laughs> talk. But I, I was like, wow, that's like the unexpected outcome. Um, you know, to the point where I don't tell them a little bit more about the new grid that you'd like to design. Yeah, so the grid right now is all based on where faculty think they are in the grid. Um, but Ruthie, I, and there's another student, Lexi, um, want to start, want to make a video explaining what full spectrum learning is from the student perspective. Because coming in, we had no idea what we signed up for. Like, we were like, sure, it's a job, but we had no idea what full spectrum learning was. And we know that it's important, like, I don't want to say dumb it down, but like explain from students to students what is full spectrum learning, the technology versus engagement, and it's the intersection of the two in just plain and simple terms, and then have students watch that before they're in the videos, and have students place their class on the grid. And if there's a major difference, talking to both the student and the professor and being like, hey, maybe you're not this far over as you think you are, or maybe you're farther than you think you are, or the student being like, why did you put your like why did why is it here so maybe having like a student perspective more than just faculty because sometimes faculty think that their class is different than it really is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Question. so how do you convince faculty to move down and to the right on the grid yeah i'm glad you asked that question and this is where one uh, this is one of the things that kind of going back to that common language um I think has helped us because it could have been perceived when we had full spectrum pedagogy that one end of the spectrum is bad and the other is good, you know, which could be threatening to some faculty that, you know, feel very strongly about, you know, the way they teach and they find it to be effective and, and so what we were saying was, no, there's value in all of this. Um, no, I, I totally get that point, and yeah. I'm a historian, yeah. so I am very rare in my own discipline for being much further down into sure. the right than most people. And, and But at the same time, I think that most historians probably should be up and to the left. Sure. But, but what I'm interested in is the susceptible people who are currently teaching, I can see that grid now thanks to the colors. <laughs> Without even, without even having it up on the screen. But how do you, the people who are susceptible to movement, how do you get them to change the way they teach, to put in the work to move down and to the right? How do you convince them that this is something they should be doing? I mean, I can get it as a university goal, but what I'm asking about is the selling process to con you know, faculty buy in, is what we tend to call it. How do, you, how do you get that? I, I think that's where the tech bar comes in and because we're supporting them and moving that way, not only, we don't just expect them to assign something and not have any idea of what, yeah. how, what it's like to create a video. We, we work the whole process of, you need to know how much time it takes to create a video before you go and assign one. And we'll walk them through that process as well. So it's sort of a hand in hand thing with people who are subsistence because if, we, I think we have a lot of good relationships with our faculty, and we have, dip, uh, like I have certain really good relationships with certain faculty. Chrissy knows everybody, so that's helpful. And, uh, <laughs> Another 20 years. <laughs> and then one of our other colleagues has really good relationships with the people that I don't have good relationships with, and that's how we're able to kind of pull them in. And once you get an example within a department, everybody in the department goes, hey, that's interesting. I think I kind of like to like no, know a little more about that. I'm or, actually not really asking about that yeah. either, because okay. if they're going to the tech bar, then you've already got them sure. to some degree. What I'm asking is, how do you get them to consider this 
as a possibility to begin with. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not sure we will, maybe, and, and to be fair, um, it, not everybody's on board with this no, yet. I totally understand um, that, but I mean, you must be making the case with people to get more people Yeah, I'm work, hopeful. And that's what I'm asking about. I don't know. When I, when I looked at the grid, uh -huh. and my, my thought was it is an easier sell, most places, to say that your courses should be more student centered. Uh, yeah. And if you make that sell, that's about moving right. Mm -hmm. And then you say, the technology is the tool you can use to make your courses more student-centered without driving yourself crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use that. <laughs> I think the other thing that too is because we have, because all these students have domains, a number of faculty have domains, and they're using these projects, they like. That's a way of awareness. You got them already. You start by training the faculty just to, to correct their own interests. Exactly. And then they introduce it in their class. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But even the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. But, go ahead. No, 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 please. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'd like to, if you could say more about the uh, how the tech bar um, has functioned. I mean, you've had amazing growth in the last two years. And um, one of the things we struggle with at Grinnell is, is is finding the right model for the, you know to have the, the student um, support here that isn't perceived as taking work away from the professional staff. And so, how do you integrate staff and students together to collaboratively support um, the digital learning and Because we're all in the same open area, Oops. it doesn't like. If a, first, if a faculty member was like, I don't want to work with a student, then we would just hop in and we would, you know what I mean? Like we would jump in on that. But because we're in an open area, most of the time the faculty start working with our students. And then if we hear something and it draws us in, we will we'll kind of help out with that to support it. But with that saying to the faculty is we trust our students there. And then also, free, we don't have a huge team. So it frees us up to do other stuff, right. which is great because we trust our students enough that they're going to be able to help with the majority of things that happen. And I think that's important. Like that hiring of really good students is super important, um, so that you can you're, you're not necessarily taking away from any one of our jobs. We're enhancing our jobs and allowing us to actually maybe dip into some things we otherwise not be able to do. So it's I get where you're coming from, but I, I think I think that that's how we handle it, I guess. And we we just view it as it's, it it helps us to, to free us up to do other stuff. But I think they know how supportive we are. We're jumping in all the time. You know, just whenever we feel like we need to. And the cool part is there's like these amazing conversations that happen around this table about everything from domains to job interviews to like, it's just crazy all the different security and two-factor authentication, like it's crazy where these things go. When it comes yeah. to instructional, something like instructional design, yeah. where a faculty yeah. member like Parisa, you know, is coming for help on I have this idea, how do I get started? And we want to start with, you know, backwards design, what are what are your overall goals? And then how might you assess that? I mean, that's, that's one of us that's helping with that conversation. But what's been um, really helpful is, you know, again, because we're all in the same area, the students are there and we can just immediately throw that back on the students and say, what do you think? Does this sound like something that, you would enjoy or you would find meaningful um, if you were in this class. And so that's, it's definitely been a partnership in that way. Or if we, they decide to mind domains and they haven't done one yet, we can talk to them about that, get them on board, and they'd be like, hey, Cassie, do you want to help them set up a domain? Mm -hmm. And then they get to see what kind of service their students are going to get as well. Like so, them feel so when you have a, a request to come in, I mean, does, does it come in to, is there one central process and then you distribute uh, or we're small yeah. enough where sometimes it'll come in as a ticket sometimes it will come in as a tech bar appointment in. and sometimes it'll be an email to one of us and we'll just say come on in so it's we're small enough that way that that's how we can handle that Good question. Question? I was wondering I, mean, I don't know if this gets to John's question because he's going to probably tell me no. That's not the question. <laughs> but I do wonder if um, you're finding from your video and from the production that Cassie did in that relationship that that's what's kind of bringing other faculty potentially in. 
Yeah, that's. I mean, yeah. like that kind of PR, and it's good. It's good because no one knows what people are doing in the classroom, and when it's good, it's probably good to get it out there. So I'd love to hear about if that's working. I'm sorry, I'm talking over the question. Okay, so originally there were four faculty that were completely on board. The director of the project was the first video we did, obviously, because he's most accessible. And then there were three other faculty that, um, I don't know if they went to DigiPed Lab, but mm -hmm. they were on board with it. So there were six videos that we had done. And we showed like people the grid, and now there's more professors. We're trying to pull one, like at least one from each department. Um, it really helps that we have three freshman students because we can convince them easier than staff convincing them. If a student asks, they're more likely to say yes. Um, so like, we're trying to get our professors on board and different things like that. And actually the grid is, isn't right now an accurate representation of campus because there are a lot of videos on the right and bottom because those are the videos that I think it's the hardest to explain and we have the least examples of. So we went after them first. Um, but I'm really excited to see next year is getting the top left filled and also explaining to professors that it's not a bad thing that you're up there. There are certain departments where that is a good thing, like I'm a math major. Um, math with technology, it works but not really. So um, like blackboards are what you have to do. So like putting videos up there I'm excited for. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Getting students to ask faculty to change their courses seems brilliant, by the way. It seems if you're not taking advantage of that, I would I would definitely do more of it. Yeah, we're not... I never thought of it. Yeah, I mean, personally, just, we're not asking them to change, but, like, we'll... We'd like more of this, please. Yeah, that, and, like, when you went and... When they said we would like our final project to be a domain, I would much rather a domain than an exam because I can create my domain, spend as much time as I want on it, make it what I want, where if I'm just like sitting there for an hour, it's not gonna be my best work. So like, it's just. Not to mention you could take it with you all the time. Yeah. We're also going through a, a pretty hardcore process right now of student experience on campus. Mm -hmm. So this stuff is gonna resonate, I think this next year, especially even more than it might have even last year. I think that will be super helpful when we talk about we want to improve the student experience and here are some ways you can do that. Um, I think that would be, it will be even easier than, than it would have been. Not that it would, it's, it is easy, it, it is, it'll be easier. It, you, you. Did we answer all your questions? Are you sure? Any yeah. other questions? <laughs> so, you asked what not to, what not to do. Yeah, going back to that. <laughs> yeah. What not to do? Definitely don't do something like don't put your students outside of where you are. Um, that that is that's the number one thing because then you can hear what they're talking about and then know like oh we need to support them more in this area or that area. I think as far as skills go, if you're only talking about domains and that's all you're really looking to support, just make sure they understand the domains piece. Our students have to do a lot more than that, um, but we're not asking them to do everything. So we have students who specialize, like they understand how to create a basic video, like they can do that much. But then we have experts in video production who can go all the way down to like what microphone should you use and how like how could you clean up this up? Like they can go crazy. We have our domains experts who can dig into code on the website and like let's let's fix some CSS on here and. Um, we have some mapping, people who do a lot of mapping for their program, they're sort of our mapping experts. Um, and then we have like productivity people or communications or you know that, that kind of stuff as well. And they, they get to, the students get to choose the things that they are good at and comfortable um, kind of helping other people with. And we've got a new system for actually choosing people for that too. So, so, you, so you're, you, know, you, you emphasize the importance of getting um, capable of competent students to begin with, but then you do provide professional development mm -hmm. opportunities for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other bonus, again, with having them in the same location that we are, is um, when we're having those conversations with faculty, you know, they're they're hearing that. So that's that's just being modeled, and then they are using some of those same uh, ways of approaching some of these challenges or some of these conversations with their peers when they're talking about the projects that they're wanting to do. So it's been a really fun growth opportunity for them.
we're out of time, but we're happy to talk with you over dinner or whatever tonight as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.